I, I have to thank Monica uh, for inviting me uh, to participate. Uh, when Monica told me what she was trying to do, uh, make sure that uh, there were uh, therapists of color who was doing work with MDMA um, and could I help in any way? Uh, of course, I said yes because I'm really, I'm really, um, I'm really excited about that possibility. I, in fact, I'm just finishing up a book called Drug Use for Grownups, trying to um, show people the benefits of psychoactive drug use because uh, we've been lied to so long in the society about drugs, and I'm trying to change that. And so anybody who's trying to help therapists and other folks understand this better, um, I'm there to support you. And by the way, you know, like terms like therapists of color, I don't like those terms, but I know that's a term that you all, you all use. I don't like it because it's, it's imprecise. Whenever we talk about people catching hell in this country, we throw people of color in there. And when really there's only a few select groups of people who are catching hell, you know. Um, so when I go to the prisons where I taught and that sort of thing, in the United States, I don't see Asian people there. You know, uh, those kinds of things. And so if you can, be precise as possible. That's what science is all about. And those kind of terms, what it does uh, is to disperse the harm such that you don't focus on the people who are catching hell. So be careful with that. And I have to also thank Rick, Rick, Rick Doblin and uh, Rick is a, a really optimistic guy and one of the people who uh, reminds me to be positive uh, when I interact with people because it's hard. You know, I'm 52 years old in the United States and I'm black, a black man. And, you know, you this is about trauma. You want to talk about a motherfucker who had trauma. Uh, you looking at him. I mean, every place I go in this country. So, but Rick reminds me, you know, to interact in situations anew uh, and give people a chance. And so I'm trying to do that. Um, so that said, I want you all to know I'm so happy to be here with you. And I know that you all are friends. Now, my talk and the way I talk, uh, I speak very passionately and I use swear words because it accentuates a point. Uh, it's flexibility in language. It's not that I'm angry with you or blaming you. So please don't take it that way. I understand that you are friends. That's why you are here. Um, so please don't be afraid of that. You feel me? Okay. Um, my title was like MDMA for the people. I like that title. Uh, but uh, Kamel asked me to speak about some specifically. And so I, I'm, uh, I need to make sure I speak about what she asked me to speak about because she had other people to do other things and she wanted things to be covered. And this is what she asked me to speak about. She asked me to discuss my research uh, over the years uh, as it relates to cannabis, cocaine, amphetamines, including MDMA. And she wanted me to show how drug laws, drug law enforcement is carried out in a racist manner, policy implications and so forth. And of course, all thinking about trauma. And, and, and I'm gonna try and do that. But before I do that, I have to lay a few ground rules. I want everybody in the room to know, I know you all know this, but uh, whenever I give a talk on drugs, I always get people who come to me afterwards like I don't know that there is risks associated with drugs. Of course there are risks. There are risks with any endeavor in life that's worth doing. I flew a plane from New York City to Louisville. There was a risk that the plane would crash and I would die. But I had to weigh the risk to benefit ratio. I had to make that calculate, weigh those calculations and decide what to do. We do it all the time. The same is true with drug use. And so I know that. And, and, and one of the things that guides my thinking in life is that as healthy 
responsible adults. I see you as being autonomous. And I see you as being entitled to the liberties and freedoms that the Declaration of Independence guaranteed for American citizens. Now, that declaration, which people should read, is really short. The second sentence says this. And then the third sentence says that government should be created for the sole purpose of protecting those liberties and freedoms. But Americans don't know that. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the drug laws that we have. And so uh, that's, that's a ground rule. Another ground rule, rule is that I need to talk about racism in terms of its definition because I will use the term racism, racist, racial discrimination, and I want you to know precisely what I mean when I said, because the country has diluted the definition so much that it takes, the sting has been, the perniciousness of this thing has been taken away. You can have people like that guy who occupies the White House say shit like, other people are racist. He's the least racist person you know. He, he says this and, and he can be believed. So when I say that, when I use the term racist, racism, I simply mean an action or actions that results in disproportionately unjust or unfair treatment of persons from specific racial groups. It's behavior. It's outcome. It's not what's in your heart. I don't care what's in your heart. I don't even care what's in your head. I only care about the action. And that's racism. That's racial discrimination. All the rest of that stuff is a distraction so you don't focus on the behavior. The behavior is what counts. Now, who's a racist? Well, first I'll say who's not a racist. There are actions sometimes that result in disproportionate treatment of people from groups and people participate unwittingly. They didn't know we all make mistakes. And they change their behavior when it's brought to their attention. We can't call those people racist. We all make mistakes. Now, who's a racist? Those people who don't modify their behavior when the evidence is brought to their attention. Those are racist people in that specific domain. So when we think, when I use the term racism, racist, and so forth, I mean in these specific domains in which I have evidence. So we're clear, okay? All right, so now let's, now we're gonna take, go through this journey. I'm gonna give you a journey of my career and touch on those issues that Camille asked me to speak about. Uh, on the left, you can see me, that was me, in the United, United States Air Force. Just want you to know, I did my time. I carried an M16 for the US military. Uh, I was a police officer at one point in the military. Um, when we bombed Libya in 86, uh, I was stationed in uh, England, and the planes that bombed Libya came from our base. We were on higher alert. We all carried M16, 16-hour shifts, ready to kill somebody. So that was me. That's what I did. Fast forward a few years after I got out of the military, had a degree. Um, I was trying to figure out how could I best serve my community. My, I wanted to make sure that I made a contribution to the community from which I came. And then, if you know what was happening about that time, uh, this is one of the things that was happening. This is crack, rock cocaine. It isn't glamorous or cool or kid stuff. It's the most addictive kind of cocaine and it can kill you. What's really bad is nobody knows how much it takes. So every time you use it, you risk dying. It isn't worth it. Look, everybody wants to be cool, but doing it with crack isn't just wrong. It could be dead wrong.
So if you really want to reach kids, get the coolest person you know <laughs> to speak to them about the issue that concerns you, right? So this was the mid to late 80s, and Nancy Reagan started her Just Say No campaign and recruited people like Pee Wee Herman to do these spots. It was influential, you know, and uh, there were other people too. Um, uh, you might recall Lynn Bias, the second uh, overall pick of the 1986 uh, NBA draft, died uh, after celebrating his pick. Um, he used cocaine. Initial reports was that it was crack. It was, that wasn't true. Uh, the country was really concerned about crack cocaine. In, in the summer of 1986, a uh, number of people came out and said, we have to do something about this drug. Um, October 1986, we declared it Crack Cocaine Awareness Month. Whatever that means, whenever there is some awareness month, you can be sure you're getting ready to be misled. But at the time, I didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that. I didn't know that. So we passed the now infamous laws, the crack powder laws that punish crack cocaine violations 100 times more harshly than powder cocaine violations. And you know, we all kind of know this law now. It required people to go to jail for a mandatory minimum sentence of five years for small amounts of crack. The, in order to trigger the same sentence for powder cocaine, you had to have 100 times more powder cocaine. We all know that. And, but you might not know that this is the law that brought back the death penalty, in which we still have on the books. So we can kill people for cocaine trafficking or drug trafficking in this country. We talk about Singapore, Indonesia, and all those kind of countries, but we have it on our books. Um, and you might not know that um, 16 of the 20 uh, black con uh, congressional black caucus members voted for this law. And I have Charlie Rangel uh, on the, as the sponsor because he was one of my representatives. I'm from New York. He represented it in my neighborhood. Uh, when I got my first grant, he wrote me a nice letter and so forth. But so Charlie Rangels was a big supporter of this law. A lot of black people were supportive of this law. Jesse Jackson did the eulogy at uh, Lynn Bias's funeral, and he talked about the horrors of drugs and that sort of thing. So people were on board. Uh, and so I, this was a way that I figured that I could serve my community. I would go and try and get a PhD study in neurobiology so I could figure out the neurobiological mechanisms that were responsible for drug addiction, for crack addiction. If I could figure that out, then I could probably solve some of the problems that the community faced, like high rates of unemployment, crime, drug addiction, all of those sorts of things. So I went to school, and this is my evolution, right? So between 1990 and 1999, you know, my demeanor was eager. I was, I came to bow. I mean, I didn't come to bow, I came to conquer. I was gonna win a Nobel Prize. I was gonna be an important professor at an important university. My relationship with the country was patriotic. Of course, I was gonna solve this problem and publish in all of the best journals. And I was always preparing for that media interview to talk about how I did it, right? And these are the kind of papers that I was publishing. I'm sure you're really interested. Specific neuro, neurophysiological effects of systemic nicotine on neurons and nucleus accumbens. Uh, nicotine's effects on dopamine clearance and rat nucleus accumbens. You all know what that means, right? Uh, so <laughs> I'm trying to figure out this neurobiological mechanism for drug addiction, nicotine, cocaine, all of these sorts of things. And this is... These are the things that I was really interested in. I was really going to make a contribution. Now, about the same time, 94, people started raising concern about the 1986, 1988 crack laws. People started raising concern because they were like, wait, there are specific people being arrested. Black people are the only ones being arrested for this law. So people started waiting concern. So Congress directed the U.S. Sentencing Commission to do a study. The U.S. Sentencing Commission, by the way, are, uh, is a body of judges that determines the, uh, penalty, the penalties for, the, for infractions. And so they determine how much time people are going to do. They did their study. 
The thing that they found out that was striking, they found a number of things, but the thing that they found out that was striking, striking was that 90% of the people convicted under those cocaine laws were black. Now, black people didn't make up the majority of crack users. Uh, white people did in absolute numbers. But they, they found things like LA County, for example. LA County is predominantly white. LA County, 92% of the people who were convicted under these laws were black. So they found out these things and they reported it. They, were, they found out other things. They found out that crack and powder indeed are the same drug. On the, on the slide here, I have powder on the left and I have crack on the right. If you focus your attention on the left, the circle, that hydrochloride group is the only difference between crack and powder. That hydrochloride group is just a salt. It has no biological activity. It doesn't contribute to the activity of cocaine. They're the same drug. I mean, it's true when you smoke crack, the effects are felt more quickly and more intensely than snorting powder. But when you, when you dissolve powder in water and intravenously shoot it, the intensity and onset of effects are, are identical as smoking the drug. They are the same drug. We and other people have shown this subsequently, but this is what the Sentencing Commission found out. And they were horrified that what was happening, and so they made recommendations. They always, when they make recommendations, the recommendations go into law. They just become law. Uh, and so, back to our definition of racist, so this racist effect was happening but the U.S. Sentencing Commission was determined to do something. So you can't, we can't call them racist. They, they amended the law. They wrote, they wrote their report, amended the law. And it would go into effect. Only way that it wouldn't go into effect if Congress and the President, Bill Clinton, blocked it. The first time in the history of the Sentencing Commission, they blocked it. And so... When we think about being a racist, now Congress and Clinton had all the information that the Sentencing Commission had, and they still determined, they still blocked the law. Bill Clinton and the members of Congress who voted to block the law were racist in that domain. That's what we call racist. Okay, now, all of this as a backdrop now, um, I didn't tell you, I went to school at the University of Wyoming for my PhD. On paper, I was there for four years, but really I spent most of my time in DC at the NIH. Um, at the NIH, one day I was going to work thinking about the dopamine transporter and dopamine metabolism uh, just in my own world. Um, and then two undercover cops came up as I'm walking towards my lab and asked could they talk to me, and I said, of course, and they said, well, Robbie, had, Robbie has occurred on the campus, and, uh, and could, could I help? And I said, absolutely, you know, uh, I'm, I wanna, wanna help. Turns out, <laughs> they thought I did the robbery, and they detained me, and then I had to do an impromptu lineup. So I'm going to work, you know, and doing, and, but this isn't the first time this kind of thing happened during that sort of 10 year period, um, when I uh, did a postdoc at UCSF, waiting on a white colleague to come pick me up at the work, like, oh, I had my computer with me. The police detained me again until my white colleague could come and vouch for me. Um, and so these kind of, when we think about trauma, as we think about trauma, <laughs> you are listening to a walking tr uh, person who's been traumatized just by going to work. So these are the kinds of things that were happening at that time while I'm trying to make this contribution for my country, trying to do this sorts of th these sorts of things. Fast forward now into my evolution. My demeanor has changed. I'm now battle-hardened. My motto has changed. Life is a marathon, not a sprint. Now I'm looking at that night manager job at Ikea. That is not looking so bad. My relationship with my, my country is disappointment. 
Uh, now I'm thinking, you know, each experiment maybe is a prelude to something important. And the night before a big experiment uh, result, I can be found at the local bar drinking, right? All right, so from this, this 2000 to 2010, I'm still doing science, but now I've changed my research focus to focus on humans. Because while at the NIH, I was one of the few black scientists, even though I, wasn't, I, I, was, only, I was doing my dissertation and I was not a PhD, they used to bring black kids from DC into my lab to see tour, during tours to see what a black scientist looked like. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's real, this is real. Um, and they asked questions that were really good. They asked questions like, you know, they may have a relative who may have a drug addiction and then I could tell them everything about a rat being addicted to cocaine, but I could tell them nothing about humans. So I did a postdoc studying humans and I tried to learn more about humans and I changed my research focus to humans. And one of the sort of first studies I did, we published in 2000 was that um, we wanted to see whether or not this notion that people who use crack um, if you gave them a choice between crack and something else, they would overwhelmingly just take crack on every occasion. And we gave them a choice between a hit of crack, several hits of crack, and like $5, some small amount of money. And what we found was that uh, they took drug on about half of the occasions and crack on the other half of the occasions. And it was inconsistent with this notion that crack addicts can't respond rationally when faced with a choice to take crack. We followed up this study and did a number of other studies, but this is just another study where we increased the amount of money uh, with something like methamphetamine. We did the same sort of thing. When you increase the amount of money to something like $20, they almost never take drug. Uh, these folks, whenever you have an attractive alternative, people take the attractive alternative. That's, it's just rational, and they behave rationally, even if they had met criteria for their cocaine use disorder. Um, so drug users can and do behave rationally. That was one of the things that we were finding out. Other people were finding this out as well. Uh, this has been replicated many times in the literature. I was also studying cannabis. Um, I was, uh, uh, there was this notion that cannabis causes all of these cognitive disruptions, and so I, I uh, had a more complex cognitive battery um, and we did this study in which got, got a lot of attention. What we found was that when you have people who smoke cannabis on a regular basis, three to seven times a week, uh, you don't see much in terms of cognitive disruptions. People may uh, perform slightly slower in terms of seconds, but their accuracy remains the same. Uh, so these were studies that we were publishing at this time, and I'm, I'm, I'm learning about drugs myself because I was operating under many misassumptions my own self. And so these sort of misconceptions that I had were being shattered at the same time. But we were also, we were really interested in finding medications that were that would disrupt cocaine taking behavior. So they could be used as a potential treatment for people who met criteria for crack cocaine use disorder. We tried a number of medications, dozens of medications, and nothing worked. Um, this is just one of the studies, and this is like, if you look at my CV, uh, they all kind of read like this. Gabapentin does not reduce smoke cocaine self-administration. Basically, just replace gabapentin with some other drug. And then that's my CV. You know, I made a career on these negative findings. But one of the things that we were finding is that even when you give people these drugs, this is just a measure of positive subjective effects in response to the cocaine. This, all of, this graph is just simply showing that uh, cocaine... <laughs> it's really good at producing euphoria, and that euphoria is hard to block. That's what this is showing. That was one of the things that we were finding. You know, after giving thousands of doses of cocaine, this is one of the most consistent findings, right? Cocaine is a hell of a drug, right? Uh, <laughs> so this is the science, but there's always this backdrop of 
what's going on in this society. You know, I spent most of my time in the lab just trying to learn my craft, trying to be a good scientist. But all this other stuff was happening with cocaine, with crack, and the law outside of the lab. And so at the same time, about the same time, people were still being arrested under the crack cocaine law. People were still, um, uh, black folks were still disproportionately being represented under this law or being uh, disproportionately arrested under this law. And the U.S. Sentencing Commission continued to come back to Congress, to the president. We now have a new president, George W. Bush, Bush II. Bush II rejected their recommendations twice. He also said, nope, we're going to keep the law the same. And then, uh, and then after uh, uh, 2007, when the presidential sort of campaign started to take off, uh, along comes Barack Obama, presidential candidate Barack Obama. And he said about this thing, he was outraged about what was going on. He said that judges think that that's wrong, Republicans think that's wrong, Democrats think that's wrong, and yet it's been approved by Republicans and Democratic presidents because no one has been willing to brave the politics and make it right. That will end when I'm president, right? By the way, he was speaking before an audience at Howard University. <laughs> you all know Howard is a black university. Um, so did it change? Well, in the Obama way, kind of, right? <laughs> so one of the things that happened under Obama is that the law changed such that crack cocaine violations were no longer punished by 100 uh, times more, but by 18 times more. Now, please recall that I pointed out that the science shows that they're the same drug. People just use it by different routes of administration. It would be like punishing people more harshly in Kentucky because they smoke cannabis as opposed to taking it orally, right? We don't do that for any drug besides crack. And so I think Malcolm X spoke to this issue, Obama's sort of uh, half-assed job in this way. Malcolm said, if you stick a knife in my back nine inches and pull it out six, there's no progress. I think that summarized what happened. Now, back to my evolution. All this is going on, right? <laughs> all of this is going on, and I'm gathering all of this data, learning about drugs, and learning that much of what I thought was wrong. And so you can see, you know, it's the evolution of a drug user scientist now. Trauma, trying to deal with the trauma. Uh, my demeanor now is really shell shock. I think you call it PTSD, right? Uh, my motto now is that I just don't engage with idiots who don't play by the rules of evidence. I just don't do it anymore. My motto now is that I am a subversive truth teller. That's who I am. And in terms of my relationship with the country, I'm looking for a new home. I'm on a two-year sabbatical, and that's what the goal of the sabbatical is, is to find a new home. I can't do this anymore. Um, now, my experiments, I still have experiments going on. But my experiments now is to collect data that undermines this war on drugs. That means... Now, what, that, what I didn't tell you is that for years I sat on grant review committees for the NIH for the National Institute on Drug Abuse. I was on the National Institute, I was on the National Institute on Drug Abuse's highest advisory council to their director. I, was, I did all that sort of stuff. And, but what it means is that I'm no longer funded by those people. Uh, I don't play that game anymore. And the night before a big result or whatever I want, you can find me altered on something like heroin or MDMA or 6-ABB, something that helps me 
be a better person and treat you all well and not bring my shit to our interactions. And what I also did in, the, in this time was that I tried to tell the American people what was really going on. I wrote this book, High Price, and explaining some of the things that I'm telling you. And I lay it out. It's a blueprint for young people who are studying science, who want to be in this field, who want to be in academe, how to negotiate a society that is hell-bent on being racist and pretending that they're not. Uh, it's a, it is a blueprint of science, uh, how to interpret brain imaging data and that sort of thing. Um, so I, I, I have to say, too, because I, I have to remind myself, I don't want to make people think that uh, there are no risks involved with drug use. I just have to, have to say this, and I just want to, like, give us an example that's been in the press recently. People talk about like cannabis and psychosis. I did a lot of studies with cannabis. I've given over a thousand doses, thousand doses of uh, cannabis to people and studied their effects. And psychosis and cannabis is a big issue today and I just wanna make sure you have some information about it before we leave. Uh, it's true that people diagnosed with psycho psychosis are more likely to report current or prior marijuana use than those folks without psychosis, that's true. But it's also true that there's, a, there's even a stronger link between tobacco use and psychosis than cannabis. It's in the literature, but that is not as sexy as cannabis. And it's also true that people who own cats during childhood are more likely to be diagnosed with psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia than folks who hadn't owned cats during childhood. If you don't believe me, go check out the literature. <laughs> this researcher, Tori, has published numerous papers on this issue. It's out there. The point here is that the correlation, by the way, correlation is not causation, and this is what people confuse it. They make that, they, they, they get confused. It would be like uh, when it rains, you know, we see umbrellas go up, and then somebody says, oh, the umbrellas are causing the rain. That's kind of how, that's what we're doing. Uh, but the point here is that the correlation between cat ownership in childhood and psychosis is as strong as a relationship between cannabis use and psychosis. They are about the same. Check it out for yourself, read the literature, it's there. But nobody's talking about cat ownership. We should be warning people about not owning cats. That's a joke, it's a joke. <laughs> but seriously, if you really want to investigate this issue and from a scientific perspective, 2016, I, along with my colleague, Charlie Kassir, we published a paper we reviewed the literature to help people to understand how they are being fooled and how uh, these data are being overinterpreted. It's all there in the literature. Uh, one of the things that I found out in my career is this, is that this is one of the more disturbing things because I have a PhD in neuroscience and I really wanted to find a neurobiological mechanisms responsible for drug addiction. This is what I really wanted to do. And so this was one of the most disturbing things for me. Uh, this notion that drug addiction, for example, causes a brain disease. This has become so pervasive. It's in the society, it's just taking this fact. But then when you look at the evidence, the evidence in humans does not support that. I wrote a nice long review. It was the cover article for the American Scientist. And I would really strongly encourage, encourage you to get it because I go through the evidence of what people are saying is pathological and what evidence they're using. And I go through, I, I painstakingly go through this so you can see for yourself and you can understand how to interpret brain imaging findings and that sort of thing. Uh, but the, uh, this, this, this piece in the American Scientist, it's easy to read, it's accessible, it's written in a way that you don't need to be an expert. 
Um, but it, it, it's, it's, I think it's instructive. Uh, and if you don't want to read a longer piece, you can, I wrote a piece in Nature. It's only a thousand words at most. Um, and in this piece, um, I'm showing that when we view drug addiction as a brain disease, what we're doing is that we're promoting social injustice. We're taking away resources, time, energy, attention, away from these social structural things that we know that we have evidence where the problem actually exists. And I'm making the argument that we're doing this intentionally. And so this piece is only a thousand words. And it's in nature. Nature is like our top journal. And it wouldn't be in nature if it wasn't strong, I assure you. Uh, so check it out if you're interested. Now, the reality is this. Drug use is overwhelmingly a positive, life-enhancing endeavor. If you attend to a few things, know something about the dose, know something about the environment in which drugs are being taken, something about the user's history, all of these basic pharmacological things that we have learned with my research and other people's research, it's overwhelmingly positive. Uh, but we haven't told the public this. But just to tell you, show you this, this was a paper we published in 2018, just to kind of uh, be a smart ass almost. Um, we, have a, uh, 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 we have a lab where we bring people into the lab and they live with us for about three weeks. And so we can do a number of things in this lab. We put them on a work schedule from nine to five in the morning and they do computer tasks for eight hours. Of course, they have breaks in between. These are cognitive tasks and so forth. Uh, and then what we can do after about five days, we can abruptly swish, swish their shift to wake them up at 12 o'clock at midnight and they work from one in the morning to 9 a.m. When you do that sort of thing back and forth, you can disrupt their cognitive performance and you can disrupt their mood, you can do all of these things. It's kind of cool. We've done this with amphetamines. It, I've done collaborations with the military. That's how I actually got into this with amphetamines. But I did it with, with marijuana to see what would happen. And marijuana uh, attenuated many of the performance disruptions and of course it improved mood. And so again, this is related to this overwhelmingly positive sort of these positive effects. Another thing that I became interested in too was just amphetamines, the, the basic structure of the amphetamine. You start with amphetamine, amphetamine is on the left, that's just the basic structure. It's a simple molecule, but you can modify it by like adding a methyl group on the right, and then you have another compound, methamphetamine. And so uh, looking at these structures, I thought, wow, they look the same. I would predict that they would, they would produce the same effect. But the verbal behavior surrounding the drugs, the language, the stories were wildly different. Amphetamine on the left, Adderall, you know, kids take it, prescribe. Uh, methamphetamine on the right, oh, that's a horrible drug. It's the most dangerous drug in 2006, they were saying. Anyway, did a study, did a study and double blind and all those sorts of things. Found out that they behave almost identical. They are, in effect, the same drug. Keeping everything equal, they're the same drug. And people, people are upset about that sort of thing, me saying that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, and then, then people misinterpret and say, oh, you should take your children off of Adderall because it's methamphetamine. What? That's not what I'm saying. That's not the point. The point is, is that they're both safe. They're both FDA approved. In fact, for ADHD. Uh, and so uh, the point is, is that the stories that we make up surrounding these drugs have little to do with the drug themselves and more to do with the context and the vilification of people than the drugs themselves. That's the point. Uh, and I was also, this brings me to a drug I really like, MDMA, right? So uh, looking at the structure of MDMA, the, the name of MDMA is methylene dioxymethamphetamine. Looking at the MDMA, wow, it looks just like methamphetamine, except for this 
ring in the red on the right. So I predicted that they would produce the same effects. Well, they produced a lot of overlapping effects. Uh, methamphetamine improved performance on a number of sort of things. MDMA did not. In fact, it disrupted the performance. Uh, but when you looked at like euphoria and some of those things, they looked the same. Now, I should tell you, uh, at this time, I hadn't done any MDMA. And so I was thinking, well, they're, they're really kind of the same drug. And then some of you all might know Dave Nichols. Dave Nichols uh, he uh, synthesized a number of these compounds, and he was uh, a student of uh, Sasha Shogun's at some point. And, uh, and I was at a meeting with Dave, and because and, and, Dave supplied the MDMA for the study, and I was like, Dave, you know, I'm getting these findings, and they're the same drug. And then Dave stepped back and looked at me like, you must have lost your mind. <laughs> and, um, but the thing is, the, the measures that we were looking at in the lab kind of showed that they were similar. It, what, it, what it highlighted for me, after having taken MDMA, of course, methamphetamine, I've taken methamphetamine, uh, it highlighted for me that many of our lab measures are not capturing uh, the sort of unique aspects of MDMA. And that's what it highlighted for me. And so, um, so some of our lab measures have a lot to be desired. That's the point. Uh, but nonetheless, both of these drugs produced primarily positive effects. Um, and this is just another study that we did with MDMA and methamphetamine on speech. The bottom line here is that methamphetamine improved speech, whereas MDMA disrupted speech, like you might expect. You know, you're on MDMA, you just kind of want to enjoy it. Shit, you don't want to be talking to people. Well, you can. Um, <laughs> Other things that I've learned along the way uh, is that our government, I uh, learned about politicians and governments, our, our government is in love with uh, stupid slogans like a drug-free America, the war on drugs. They love these stupid slogans. So you have to ask why politicians love these slogans and they conceal what's the truth. Well, they conceal the truth about drugs because they benefit. But they're not the only, they benefit because they say, we're in Kentucky. They think they have an opioid problem, I know. Uh, politicians say, I have a solution, and then the population says, hooray, hooray, we vote for you. And so they have a solution to a perceived problem that, uh, and that's why they love them, and uh, that's, that's one of the things, and law enforcement love them because their budgets increase. Treatment providers love them because, uh, love this war because they can say, we know about drugs and, um, and you, they're too dangerous for you, but not us, and we can teach you this, and, and they, they also love them. Um, the media love them because of the stories that they tell. Scientists like me, we love them because we get big grants to study this stuff. Um, and so the, the point here is that it's difficult to get a man or a woman to understand something when his or her salary depends upon him or her not understanding it. Simple. It also allows us to avoid dealing with the real problems that poor people face. Unemployment, substandard education, poor health care, uh, low income, all of these sorts of things. You don't have to deal with those things. You can just say, we're going to rid our community of drugs. That's all you have to say. And then, more importantly for me today, it allows us to target, target people we don't like without explicitly saying so. We do this all the time, but who can say it better than the former governor of Maine? Uh, Governor LePage was talking about out-of-state drug dealers coming to Maine in response to a question. It's a topic he discusses at a lot of town hall forums. Here's what he said last night. The traffickers, these are people that take drugs. These are guys that are named D-Money, Smoothie, Shifty, uh, <laughs> these type of guys. They come from Connecticut, New York. They come up here, they sell their heroin, then they go back home. Incidentally, half the time they impregnate a young white girl before they leave, <laughs> which is a real sad thing because then we have another issue that we've got to deal with down the road. So well, we think about this sort of opioid crisis we have in the country. We know that, for example, 
black, Latino folks are not the primary users of these drugs, but at the federal level, 80% of the people who are convicted for trafficking are black and Latino. Um, we can look at the same thing for marijuana convictions. It, you just go down the list. I get tired of talking about that because it's so obvious. But the point here is that people like me have to listen to bullshit like this. And then uh, we act like we act like this isn't abhorrent. We act like this guy should be in office. And he, he, he served his term, two terms. And we're cool with it as a country. This is the stuff that I have to think about as someone with black boys. This is a matter of life and death for my boys, not an academic sort of endeavor. This is what I think, like, uh, this is how it is for my boys, for me. Um, uh, let's go to the next slide. These, this, is, this is how I see it. This is from Baltimore, 2015, but all these cops are chasing this brother. That's how I feel. That's what I worry about with my boys in this society. And then I think about what the narratives we have put around drugs this is just cannabis. cannabis. Cannabis is legal. Recreational cannabis is legal in 10 states. Legal in the entire country of Canada. These are all the people who were recently killed as a result of suspicion of cannabis. And in many cases, the cops said that they were threatened or they felt threatened because the person was smoking cannabis. I have given thousands of doses of cannabis under the auspices of the government. They pay me to do this. And I know that's like bullshit, but that's a narrative that continues in our country. And so you say like, fuck. And so I have to use the words of James Baldwin when he said like to be a Negro and a scientist in this area, in this country, and to be relatively conscious is to be enraged almost all the time. And so like I started, I don't want you all to think I'm angry with you. I just want you to understand my passion. And then I have to do my own work holding this shit throughout this country. And so part of my work is this. I. I do psychoactive substances, and I try to find the good in people, in me, and I try to make sure that I'm treating people well despite all of this that I'm carrying. But MDMA, 6-APB, heroin, all of those drugs have been outstanding in that capacity. Now, all right, I'm gonna wrap up because I think I've gotten a sign to say, wrap this shit up. Okay. <laughs> I just wanna say, just kind of like the challenges that we are faced with, we have a problem. And as you go about doing your work as therapists and we think about this thing, we're talking about MDMA for medicine and therapy. It frightens me that the medical community is in control of any damn thing. When I go to get my opioids from my physician and then the pharmacists look at me and then they restrict it. Not my physician, just so you have at every level these people restrict. So my wife is a white woman. So well, now what I do, I just say, well, have her go get it. And it works better. That's fucked up. I'm the pharmacologist. But that's the kind of mind games that they play on people like me in this society. So I worry about restrictions. I worry about who's in control. Because when we have the medical community be in control, it's the same dominant culture that has been oppressing my people. Same culture. So I worry about these sort of <laughs> restrictive drug policies that restrict my and other people's freedoms. 
when you do that sort of things, people try to find a way around it, and then it increases the likelihood that they get these dangerous substances that contain adulterants, and the adulterants are far more dangerous than the substance that they're seeking. That's the problem we have. And so the challenge for us, the challenge that I'm giving you, a bigger challenge, is to think about having or developing these drug policies that respects individuals' civil liberties. Somebody told me they were a civil liber they were a libertarian. <laughs> Libertarians have it right here. These policies that respect people's civil liberties and enhance public health and safety. We can do it. And we can do it by implementing these regulatory schemes that permit adult use, just like we've done with alcohol. But of course, we have to do a better job of our education. And, be, and in the meantime, before we do it all the way, we can just make sure also that we have these things we call drug checking available, drug safety checking available, where people can take their substance that they bought off the street or what have you, and have a chemical analysis of the components in their substance. They do this in Austria, they do this in Spain, they do this in Switzerland, they do it around the world, Colombia, they do it all around the world. And we can do it in the United States. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. And I'd like to uh, open up the floor for short speeches that are disguised as questions. <laughs>